we will continue with the next session on hypothyroidism and thyroid comorbidities i welcome the chairpersons for this session dr vijay baskar reddy consultant endocrinologist puducherry he is the organizing secretary of trendu 2020 he is the org and i welcome dr kumar tulasi das consultant endocrinologist Dr. Kamakshi Memorial Hospital and SRMC Chennai. He was trained in UK and has multiple publications. I request the chairpersons to introduce the speakers and take over the session. Hello, uh, Dr. Vijay Bhaskar. I think you are going to introduce Dr. Uh, Shanmugasundar. Hello, Kumar. Sorry, actually, this uh, now it's uh, audible. Yeah, yeah, you are audible now. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I thank uh, the overwhelming response given by our delegates. I thank all our uh, speakers and chairpersons. for having joined us for trendo 2020 so first speaker for today's talk is dr shanmugh sundar he'll be talking on anti thyroid drugs how much and how long so he is consultant co director magna healthcare ashok nagar chennai and he's also consultant at esa medical college chennai he's best outgoing student in mbbs and he's been topper in various uh, uh, various branches in uh, mbbs and university topper in anatomy also he is also got the winner of av gandhi award for best clinical acumen spot diagnosis in endocrinology in 2010 his multiple publications in index journals over to dr shanmugh sundar good evening everyone uh, thanks vijay baskar reddy for the kind introduction and so my topic is on anti thyroid drugs how much and how long so basically it's an almost an eight decade old molecule so if you see the anti thyroid drugs are there since 1940 but still lot of uh, controversies or questions are uh, existing with the therapeutic point of view like what drug to use how much to use and whether that influences the remission and uh, whether it influences the radioiodine ablation success rate and what the main concerns also related to the side effects and what drug to use during the pregnancy so in my brief talk i will be addressing all this uh, main issues This is. I will start with a small case. So this is about a 20 year old so married unmarried woman, present with the typical symptoms of signs and signs of hyperthyroidism, and she has uh, Graves' abnormality and she has a diffuse goiter. So clinically itself, she is like a Graves' disease. And thyroid function test confirms the same thing. T3, T4 are elevated, and TSH is below the normal limit. And a TSH receptor antibody was positive. After discussing various options for therapy with the patient, like uh, anti-thyroid drugs, radiation ablation, or surgery, the patient decided that she would be feel most comfortable with the course of oral drugs. So now, questions: What are the questions we need to know? Why to treat her? What is the importance? And which drugs should be used to treat this patient, either propyl thyroxine or methimazole or carbamazole? And how long should she be treated to optimize the chance of remission? Because in you know, hyperthyroidism, we always talk about remission. Uh, whereas ultra in hyperthyroidism, where we will be continuing the drug mostly lifelong. And what dose should be used initially to get the disease under control? And whether this initial drug dose influences the chance of remission? And the last question: the pre-treatment with anti-thyroid drug before radiation ablation affects the treatment success. That is the success rate of the radiation ablation. So I will take one question uh, one by one. Why to treat? The first answer is simple: symptomatic relief. Usually, we start the patient on beta blocker, and in some patient where beta blocker is contraindicated, calcium channel blocker. At the same time, we have to also control the hyperthyroidism. So, we have to start the patient on either anti-thyroid drugs or go for the uh, definitive therapy. And other complex, other main important thing is untreated hyperthyroidism can lead to multiple other uh, complications. Main thing is cardiac complications. We all know that hyperthyroidism patient at risk for tachyarrhythmias. and they can also present with cardiac failure and there is also increase in the cardiovascular mortality and morbidity and other complications are graves optimopathy and a secondary osteoporosis is always if young patients present with osteoporosis always rule out hyperthyroidism and untreated hyperthyroidism can also lead to thyrotoxic crisis so we have to treat this patient 
and what are the clinical fact features that favor particular modality as a preferred treatment so if we see anti thyroid drugs it can be used in most of the condition except in patients with liver disease that is if hcd sdpt is more than five times the normal limits it's better to avoid anti thyroid drugs and if patient had already had some adverse reaction to anti thyroid drugs like agranulocytosis hepatotoxicity or pancreatitis we should avoid anti thyroid drugs otherwise in most of the conditions anti thyroid drugs are preferred and radio iodine ablation mainly if there is a contraindication to anti thyroid drugs and in conditions like uh, if the patient presents with a life threatening uh, side effects complication like periodic paralysis or tachycardia or atrial fibrillation cardiac failure it's always better to go for the definitive therapy so it's better to start the patient with anti thyroid drugs and go for the definitive therapy surgery is indicated mainly if we suspect some uh, thyroid malignancy of patient as uh, multinodular goiter or associated primary hyperparathyroidism so in most of the situation we will be going with either anti thyroid drugs or radio iodine ablation coming to the second question which drug is preferred so to answer this question the following uh, the drug should and satisfy the following questions which drug is more effective ptu or methimazole which drug is less toxic very very important which drug is associated with greater patient compliance and which drug is less costlier and what are the effects of ptu and methimazole on the efficacy of subsequent radio iodine ablation so this table column uh, gives the answer So if you see the response time, it's faster with the methimazole, whereas it's slow with the propyl thiazole. So this study shows that around 80% of the people taking methimazole achieves the euthyroidism within 5.8 weeks, whereas people taking propyl thiazole achieves the euthyroidism by 16.8 weeks. So that's a gross difference between the uh, response rate with methimazole and PTU. So people respond better with the methimazole. Coming to the, uh, toxicity and compliance. The, if you take minor side effects like arthralgia or skin side effects, there is no major difference between the both the drugs. And in methimazole, mostly it's a dose related. So if you see the side effects are mostly noted in the first two to three months. After that, while tapering the dose, usually the side effects are not seen. Whereas PTU, uh, it is not dose related, and uh, the side effects can happen at any time. And the serious side effects like hepatotoxicity and anchor positive vasculitis are more common with PTU. So definitely, if you take uh, see from toxicity point of view, methimazole scores over the PTU. And as methimazole is usually once day dosing, the compliance is better with the methimazole. If you see the cost, Indian cost, it's not a major difference between the molecules. So if you compare PTU three hundred milligram per day versus methimazole twenty milligram and carbimazole thirty milligram per day, there is a no major uh, difference in the cost between the molecules. Coming to the last point, effect on radio iodine outcome. So, patient who are taking PTU, the chance of failure with radio iodine ablation is more compared to people who are taking methimazole. So, in a one study, they have seen that 80% of the people taking methimazole had a, a good uh, cure by the radio iodine ablation with the dose of 10 millicurie, whereas only 30% of the PTU PTU people uh, pre-treated patients had a cure with the radio iodine. So this data shows that if patient is taking PTU, the chance of success with the radio iodine subsequent radio iodine ablation is also less. So usually the patient will require 25 to 30% more radio iodine dose compared to people who are on methimazole. So taking all these points, it's very clear that methimazole uh, or carbimazole scores over the PTU in each and every point. So it should be used in every non-pregnant patient who chooses ATT as a primary uh, anti-thyroid drug therapy as a primary therapy. But still, there are few conditions or clinical settings in which PTU is preferred. So there are three instances where PTU is preferred in patients during the first trimester of pregnancy because we are more worried about the congenital malformation secondary to that drug. So if you see the data, the congenital malformation due to a drug is same with the PTU and the methimazole. It's almost two to four percentage with the both the drugs. But the severity of the congenital malformation is more with the methimazole compared to the PTU. PTU is a minor side effects congenital mal malformation. So always in the first trimester, better to uh, put the patient on PTU rather than methimazole or carbimazole. Second indication is for the initial management of patients with Thyrotoxicosis, life-threatening thyrotoxicosis, or thyroid storm, because we all know that PTU also has an effect on the type one dehydrogenase. So it inhibits the conversion from T4 to T3. So at the end of 24 hours, if you see the T3 level will be more uh, towards the normal range with PTU compared to the methimazole. Third indication is if already patient has taken carbimazole or methimazole as some minor reaction, but the patient doesn't want to go for the radio iodine or surgery. Then we can put the patient on PTO. So these are the only three instances where PTO is preferred over the methimazole or carbimazole. Uh, next question: How long the therapy should be given? I think the more, more, one of the most important part of my talk. 
again it depends on the clinical scenario in some patient before radio pre preparation for radioid inoblation it's better to give the uh, methimazole or carbimazole so there are school two schools of thought in uh, certain patients like uh, mild hyperthyroidism where severity is less we can put the patient on beta blocker and subject the patient for radioid inoblation but in some patient like elderly population or the patient having associated uh, cardiac comorbidities where hyperthyroidism can lead to uh, complications it's better to treat the patient with methimazole or carbimazole make the mutheroid and subject the patient for radioid inoblation but stop the uh, drug 3 days before the therapy and restart 3 to 7 days after radioid inoblation and slowly taper the drug and in preparation for thyroidectomy again uh, the patient is at risk for thyroid storm so it's better to make the patient mutheroid with the drugs uh, at least for uh, give the drug for 4 to 6 weeks make the mutheroid t4 within the normal range and can discontinue the drug from the day of the surgery because the patient is uh, at risk for thyroid storm uh, during the surgery and also 18 hours post surgery so it's better to continue till the date of surgery and most important is when to stop if the methimazole or carbimazole is pref uh, preferred as a primary therapy So this is a study published in JCM 2003. So based on four trials, prospect randomized trial. So if you see the first trial, they compare the people who took the drug for six months versus 18 months. So their lapse rate is almost 60 percentage in people who took the tablets for six months, whereas it's only 35 percentage in the people who took the tablet for 18 months. So clearly there is a difference. If the patient is taking the drug for 18 months, their lapse rate is considerably almost 50% less in the people who took 18 months versus 6 months whereas in the other three studies they compared between 12 and 24 months 6 and 12 months and 18 and 42 months there is no statistically significant difference between the both the groups in in terms of relapse so this study clearly shows that at least 12 to 18 months of therapy is ideal to make them uh, euthyroid and also to prevent the relapse so that's what the guidelines also say so 12 to 18 months seems ideal but the question question is what if there is a relapse or if patient has not gone into remission and patient doesn't want either the either of the definitive therapy that is radioid inoblation or surgery so in that case we have to continue the patient on methimazole or carbimazole for long term so what are the data on long term therapy that is beyond 18 months these are all recent data so it is it was published in 2019 so here they have taken the untreated first uh, graves this is patient they gave, they have given the page, uh, 18 to 14 months of uh, methimazole then they randomized the patient into long term group that is they continue the drug for almost 3 to 10 years and second group conventional group where they stop the therapy and after stopping the therapy they follow the patient for 4 uh, years that is 48 months so in this if you see side effect profile there is no difference between the both the group so all the side effects whatever happened with the methimazole happened in the first 18 months so after that there is no side effect because already i, I told most of the side effects in methimazole is related to the dose so here they are using the low dose so no side effects observed after 18 months and i had some recurrence after stopping the therapy is only 15 percentage that means 85 percent of the people achieved remission if people are given long term methimazole whereas almost 50 percent of the people relapsed in the conventional group that is if the drug is stopped after 18 to 24 months almost 50 percent uh, relapse So this uh, study clearly shows that low dose methimazole, even up to 10 years of therapy, is safe, and the remission rate rate is almost 80 percentage. The second study, it, they took the patient that relapsed, and they given they are divided into two group. One is continuous low dose uh, methimazole, second is radiodin, and they again they follow up the patient for 10 years to see the uh, what is what are the thyroid dysfunction and total cost and the side effects. in this there is no significant difference in age sex duration of symptoms and thyroid function between the two group and no serious complication between the uh, difference between the both the group and cost of the treatment is less in the uh, drug group that is a methimazole group compared to the radioiodine group so there is no much difference between the two groups and the third study again a good study where they included the uh, uh, grave this is lap patient here also they continued uh, people with uh, 2.5 to 7 mg of methimazole versus grave disease versus radioiodine and they analyzed for thyroid dysfunction and the uh, uh, progression of the grave ophthalmopathy and quality of life in this study also there is no notable side effects between the both the group and thyroid dysfunction mainly hypothyroidism is more common in the radioiodine group whereas euthyroidism is more common in the methimazole group which is uh, statistically significant again it's expectable because with radioiodine ablation almost 80 to 90% of the people go into hypothyroidism and grave uh, uh, ophthalmopathy deterioration was more in the radioiodine group which is statistically significant 
and weight gain is more in the radioiodine group probably most of the patient would have gone into hypothyroidism and quality of life there is no significant difference between the uh, two group so all this is that is clearly shows that even after 8 to 18 months of therapy by continuing low dose of therapy in people who had relapse or are not going into remission it is safe and equally efficacious so what should we do in our clinical practice because the initial data shows 12 to 18 months is optimal and the new data shows that continuing up to 10 years also safe and efficacious so when the patient comes to us with hyperthyroidism it's better discuss with the patient the tentative duration of the therapy which is ideally 12 to 18 months so give that the start the therapy and gradually taper the dose at the end of this uh, particular duration reassess whether the patient is going into remission or there is a chance of relapse then give the option to the patient whether to go for definitive therapy like radiodine ablation or surgery or to continue the uh, methimazole for long time uh, because the data shows it is efficacious and safe compared to the radiodine ablation so it's better to discuss with the patient at initial in, initial time itself and then uh, take the call at the end of 12 to 18 months whether we can predict collapse at after the 12 to 18 months there are few parameters by which we can predict whether the patient can go into remission or there is a risk for collapse so the younger the age male patients if the patient is smoker patient has large goiter at presentation or at the end of the therapy and if patient has graves op- orbitopathy then more likely that patient is prone for risk so these are the patient where we have to monitor properly and they, if they have relapsed either we have to go for definitive therapy or give the option of this long term uh, carbimazole or methimazole and another option is measuring the tsh receptor antibody so if the tsh receptor antibody is more than 3.85 at the end of 18 months of therapy more likely 96% of the time there is a chance of relapse so better give the option of uh, definitive therapy or continuing the oral drug continuously to this patient and if tsh receptor antibody is less than 2 then mostly the patient will not go for relapse so this are the patient where we are confidently we can stop anti thyroid drugs so trap gives an idea whether to continue the therapy or go for the definitive therapy at the end of 18 months based on this the american thyroid association and european thyroid association recommends that uh, ideally 12 to 18 months uh, therapy should be given so that the chance of remission is more and if tsh is normal and trb levels are normal at that time we can stop the therapy course if they are not normal then uh, we have to give the option of definitive therapy versus long term uh, methimazole or carbimazole therapy coming to last part of my talk talk that is a drug dosage again very important so what dose should be used initially to get the disease under control whether the initial drug dose influences the chance of remission so first part i will discuss about the uh, disease control so this is a recommendation if t4 is 1.1 1.5 1, 1. times more than the upper limit of normal start with 5 to 10 mg of methimazole or 10 to 15 mg of carbimazole 1.5 to 2 times start with 10 to 20 mg of methimazole if it is 2 to 3 times more than the upper limit of normal if severe hyper hyperthyroidism either 30 to 40 mg of methimazole or 50 to 70 mg of carbimazole whether this recommendation are based on studies yes there are a lot of scientific data to uh, validate this so this is the one study where they compare the methimazole and propylthyroxine in patient with uh, grave disease so they have divided into three group methimazole 30 mg p2 300 mg methimazole 15 mg So overall in the study group if we see the control is better in the methimazole 30 mg versus p2 300 and methimazole 15 at the end of 4 weeks 8 weeks and 12 weeks but the beauty of this study is the sub analyst the patient with uh, free t4 less than 7 and free t4 more than 7 so basically they have taken mild to moderate uh, hyperthyroidism in one group and more severe hyperthyroidism in an- another group So in mild to moderate hyperthyroidism you will see at the end of 4 and 8 weeks there is no significant difference between the 30 mg and 15 mg of methimazole but end of 12 weeks it is different but if we see that severe hyperthyroidism definitely there is a gross difference between 30 mg and 15 mg at 4 weeks and 8 weeks itself so this clearly shows that in mild to moderate we can give the low dose 15 mg methimazole compared to 30 mg but in severe hyperthyroidism definitely we need to go for the Uh, higher dose to have the uh, faster uh, euthyroidism and side effects are also less in the 15 mg compared to the methimazole 30 mg and ptu 300 mg again another similar study where they used 20 and 40 mg of carbimazole in the initial treatment of hyperthyroidism they also classified patient based on the t4 level so in patients with t4 more than 21 versus t4 less than 21 
If the patient has T4, initial T4 more than 21, that is a severe hyperthyroidism. If you use 20 milligram dose of carbimosol, most of the patients are in hyperthyroidism. Whereas 40 milligram dose, almost 30% are in hyperthyroidism. Rest of the 70% either euthyroid or hypothyroid. So definitely they respond better to the 40 milligram. But if you see the mild to moderate hyperthyroidism, even with 20 milligram of carbimosol, most of the patients, almost 70% of the patient achieved euthyroid or hypothyroid, only 30%. This black indicates hyperthyroidism, percent of the people in hyperthyroid state. Only 30% of the people are in hyperthyroid. Whereas if the, in mild to moderate, if you are using 40 milligram of uh, carbimosol, most of the patients are going into hypothyroidism, severe hypothyroidism. So in short, based on this study, decide the initial dose based on the severity of the hyperthyroid. Coming to the second part, role of thionomate dose in predicting the remission. That is, whether if you are going to start higher dose, whether the chance of uh, going to remission is high. Let's see the studies. So this is by the European Multicenter Study Groups in Grace disease. Here they compared between the 40 milligram uh, methimosol and uh, 10 milligram methimosol. So biochemical euthyroidism was achieved more quickly with the higher dose, but the rate of remission was similar for the doses and side effects are more common with the higher dose. Another study from the Japan. Here they analyze between methimosol 10 milligram TDS, 30 milligram per day versus 15 milligram once a day. Here again, the rate of relapse is almost same. 61% with 30 milligram and 63% with the uh, 15 milligram. So there is no difference in the remission rate or uh, risk for relapse based on the initial drug dose. So initial drug dose would be purely based on the severity of the hyperthyroidism. What should we do in our clinical practice? So, although the initial response is faster with higher dose than the lower dose of thionamide, eventual relapse rate appears similar. And side effects are also more common with the higher dose. So, start initial dose purely based on the severity of the hyperthyroidism. Don't worry about the remission rate. So, to summarize my talk, so, uh, there are a lot of questions to be answered. So, uh, what are the available, best available answer I am giving? So, which drug is preferred? So, definitely, methimosol and carbimosol is preferred over the uh, propyl thyroxyl. And propyl thyroxyl is uh, preferred in only three uh, situations, mainly in the first trimester of pregnancy, thyrotoxicosis crisis, and the patient has some reaction, minor reaction to methimosol. And how long it should be, the patient should be treated? Ideally, 12 to 18 months. So discuss with the patient that you will, the patient will be put on the drug for 12 to 18 months, even they attain euthyroidism in between. And at the end of this, reassess whether the chance of relapse is there, then discuss with the patient for uh, either definitive therapy or continuing the uh, methimosol for long term. Again, data shows that even continuing the drug for 10 years, it is safe and efficacious, and the remission rate is almost 85%. Even in uh, children, the data says that if the long term methimosol, uh, the remission rate is almost 75% compared to 25% if the drug is used for 12 to 18 months. Do higher dose bring the disease under rapid, more rapid control? Definitely, yes. So the initial drug dose should be purely based on the severity of the hyperthyroidism. Does the initial dose influences the chance of remission? Probably not. So don't choose the initial dose based on uh, this indication. Are there baseline predictors for the likelihood remission? Yes, the severity of hyperthyroidism, presence of goiter and trap titers, and as I told, the younger age, male, graves, orbitopathy, and smoke, smoking status all indicates the likelihood of remission. The speed treatment with anti thyroid drug decreases the adverse outcomes after radio denoblation or probably surgery? Possibly, yes. In selected patients, if the patient has severe hyperthyroidism or patient has comorbid condition, always better to make the patient euthyroid before subjecting to radio denoblation or surgery so that the uh, complication due to hyperthyroid can be prevented and thyrotoxicosis storm can be prevented during surgery. And even with radio denoblation, some patients may present with thyrotoxicosis storm. So better to treat it with the uh, selected patients with the antithyroid drugs. The speed treatment with antithyroid drugs before radio denoblation affects the treatment success with methimosol data says no. But with PTU, data says yes, it thus influences the success rate with radio ablation. So better to give the higher dose of radio ablation if patient is on PTU. Thank you. Thank you very much for the patient's listening. Thank you, Dr. Sundar, for your uh, excellent talk. I think you covered uh, uh, all the details about uh, antithyroid drugs, how much and how long. A uh, few questions are there from audience. So you divided into... Methimazole, carbimazole in one group versus propyl thioracyl. But would you differentiate between methimazole and carbimazole in India? You have both. Which would you prefer? So 
again uh, methamphetamine is active form of the carbamazole so other than uh, the drug dosage there is no major difference between the carbamazole and methamphetamine so for example if you are uh, using 6 mg of methamphetamine it is equal to the 10 mg of uh, carbamazole so other than that there is no major difference between the drugs okay so then one more question from the audience is uh, you started carbamazole after two weeks patient comes with elevated uh, alt ast of around uh, 120 iu per liter would you still continue or would you consider stopping the carbamazole see again uh, uh, routinely we uh, most of the times we don't monitor also and the guidelines also not recommend the same thing but at least before starting the therapy it's better ideal to do the uh baseline uh, stot sgpt if it's more than five times better not to start but after starting the therapy it's always better uh, to say the patient if they have some symptoms like dark color urine itching or uh, jaundice then it they have to uh, report to us and we have to do the lft if it's more than three times elevated from the baseline always it's better to stop the treatment and reassess or probably go for the alternative therapy like definitive therapy or the ptu and many times in hyperthyroidism also there will be transaminases that's why if a baseline up to 5 times uh, we can uh, very well start the patient with on antithyroid drugs but if it's more than 5 times it's better not to start last question is uh, you are starting antithyroid drugs for relapse of graves disease so how long would you continue in this setting is it lifelong antithyroid drugs or uh, would you consider stopping after some time for relapse case so again it's uh, always better to reassess annually so one thing is we can check whether the patient is youth or not and if a patient is affordable we can check the trab levels always if trab levels are uh, normalized and the youth thyroidism is maintained for a few months then probably we can stop the drug if no then we can continue the drug because the data says that up to 10 years a low dose therapy there is a, its efficacy and side effects are no major difference between the radio iodine ablation and this one and quality of life is also same so if patient is not willing for uh, the definitive therapy definitely we can uh, continue the therapy uh, for lifelong also because we do it in toxic multinodal goiter where a patient is not willing for surgery or radio iodine ablation we do continue the therapy for long term and the patients are doing well the same thing applies here also thank you dr sundar i think uh, you covered all the aspects i request dr kumar tulsidas to in, uh, introduce the next speaker thank you sundar thank you. good evening everybody um, so the next topic is uh, thyroid and diabetes um, as we know the thyroid and diabetes forms the bread and butter of any endocrine practice in fact they go hand in hand in many instances uh, worldwide about 12 to 16% in different uh, parts of the world and there is an as clear cut association and diagnosed thyroid diseases hyper or hypothyroidism can lead to adverse diabetes outcomes as well as uh, poor uh, diabetic complications outcome um so uh, dr arul prakash is here to talk about uh, thyroid and diabetes associations um he is a senior endocrine consultant at the indra diabetes center in tutkorin and he has completed uh, his uh, endocrine training in the united kingdom he is also a member of royal college of physicians of uk as well as a prestigious fellow of royal college of physician london and he has also been an executive member of estn for quite a few years has been faculty in many trendo and epicon meetings uh, he has uh, been a part of uh, real world studies edge and ideal uh, studies uh, and he has made uh, enormous contributions uh, in terms of articles to uh, in cardio diabetology area in api medicine update books uh, welcome sir we are very eager to hear you on thyroid and diabetes thank you kumar for, for the nice words and uh, i thank first of all uh, dr vijay baskar reddy uh for inviting me to the session to speak on thyroid and diabetes let me just check uh where do we start just looking for this looking from my desktop yeah yeah just to be there yeah uh, as as it opens up uh, let me just start the prelude uh, as uh, kumar put it out uh, thyroid 
disorders in diabetes are more common disorders in the common endocrine practice. Uh, also in general medical practice as well. Even the endocrine practitioners will be seeing at least 90% of the problems. Uh, uh, Kumar, am I visible? My yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, you are. Right. right, okay, yes. The thyroid dysfunction and diabetes are the more common endocrine problems for the general practitioners, general medical practice, as well as, you know, the endocrine practice. Both the hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism have been investigated to be associated with diabetes mellitus. Uh, you know, in the, in the day in and day out, we see a lot of patients coming in, uh, suggestive of, uh, you know, if an obese person comes to you, the first thing that stri strike your mind is could be hypothyroid, especially if it happens to be a woman. And also, you also think of diabetes. Uh, you know, as a comorbid condition of obesity and all that. So if you're very vigilant, uh, you tend to think of diabetes and uh, thyroid disorders quite commonly in the practice. So how do you connect these two together? That, that's a problem. So when the topic was given to me, I thought probably I can find a lot of materials on the net, but uh, it was really interesting to see that very few papers are available on the net. And uh, uh, I just happened to review an article submitted by Sanjay Kalra, who, you know, uh, put it online uh, in the journal. So that was quite useful. So I'll try to just, you know, share my idea of what I gathered so far. So they intersect these both, you know, huge diseases, uh, intersect at genetic, metabolic level, and resulting in escalation of uh, so many cardiovascular morbidities. Uh, just go, going back to basics, you know, it's a, they're all con uh, connected with the fuel metabolism or energy metabolism. So the AMPK, uh, adenosine mono, uh, monophosphate kinase, is a peptide uh, enzyme, which is very much, it's a key player in the energy metabolism. So if you see the left panel, uh, you know, it, it acts on the liver, increasing fatty acid oxidation, decreases cholesterol synthesis, decreases lipogenesis. On the pancreas, it modulates insulin uh, secretions. So where, you know, it could be, you can think that uh, obviously the insulin touch up upon all these important organs like liver, skeletal muscles, pancreas, and adipocytes. And so there seems to be an overlap here. So on skeletal muscles, increases fatty acid oxidation, increases glucose uptake, and in adipocytes, that decreases lipogenesis, decreases lipolysis. So the AFPK is stimulated by GH relin, calorie restriction, hyperthyroidism, exercise. And of course, it's inhibited by leptin, hypothyroidism, diabetes, obesity. So all these three hypothyroid, diabetes, and obesity. So probably is where they overlap. So if you see the thyroid hormone action on the, on, in, if it, in hyperthyroidism, on the left-hand side, you see the T3 acts on the hypothalamus. But there is a compartmentalization here in the fuel metabolism. Uh, the T3, you know, uh, suppresses AMPK at the hypothalamus, whereas it stimulates at the level of uh, liver, skeletal muscles, pancreas, and adipose tissue. So resulting in decreased, uh, so that's what happens in hyperthyroidism. Uh, there is increased lipolysis, and then increased uh, uh, gluconeogenesis, and uh, the, uh, resulting in hyperglycemia. Whereas the hypothyroidism, there is decreased glucose levels, decreased ectopic fat deposition, and increased insulin sensitivity. So there is a reduced requirement of insulin. There is reduced renal clearance of insulin also as well. As there is, uh, in the net results, a reduced uh, insulin availability and reduced glucose. And there is a reduced lipolysis. So in short, the diabetes, uh, inhibits AMPK, so also the hypothyroids, but whereas uh, the reverse is done by the hypothyroids. So let's 
come back to the uh, you know, topic again, that thyroid and diabetes, where do they meet? There's some of the important observations have been made and published. So regarding type 1 diabetes, and both uh, the thyroid as well as uh, type 1 diabetes share a common utilizable fact in autoimmunity. So, you, you know, the most common problem is hypothyroid sensitive to autoimmune thyroiditis. And another very important observation which has been made was founded in forehead of the Cambridge team with colleagues from afar reports thyroid hormones powerfully influence the development of pancreas itself. This, of course, it's in, a, in an experimental model, in an animal experiment. And the concentrations of fetal thyroid hormones are decreased by thyroidectomy. Proliferation of pancreatic beta cell increases, but not alpha cell mass. And hypothyroidism also led to the enhanced beta cell growth and increased plasma insulin and lipid concentrations. Very important uh, observation. So in contrast, the thyroid hormone inhibited fetal uh, beta cell proliferation in the culture. Some, you know, just a connection was very uh, striking. The untreated and sub or suboptimally managed diabetes, both in type 1 and type 2 diabetes, may induce a low T3 state, a kind of hypothyroidism, which is being, you know, uh, seen in untreated diabetic patients. So it's characterized by both total as well as free T3 levels, but not TSH and free T4 levels. So the basic, uh, you know, uh, on the molecular level and uh, uh, regard, with regard to the energy metabolism as well as uh, in the observations and the experimental observation, they show that there is a, a good connection between these two. So we'll come to the prevalence of both the diseases. The European uh, meta-analysis showed that thyroid dysfunction is present in 3.82% of the general population, whereas among the diabetes is significantly higher, ranging from 99 .9 to 14%. That's what Kumar said. You know, uh, the incidence of thyroid dysfunction is quite high among the diabetes. And the women with type 1 diabetes show a very high prevalence of hypothyroidism at 31%, which is very high, with an overall prevalence of thyroid disease and diabetes at 13.4%. In type 1 diabetes, of course, it's an autoimmune problem, where 3.5% had autoimmune thyroiditis or Hashimoto's thyroiditis. A 3.5-fold increase of a risk of autoimmune thyroiditis was noticed in GADA positive, GAD65 positive anti uh, patients. Positive TPV antibodies have been reported as high as 38% among diabetic patients. This is a strong predictor for the development of future hypothyroidism. So, which means that probably you should be on the lookout for, uh, for the future thyroid patients in diabetes. The prevalence of thyroid function decreases with, uh, increases with the advancing age and is higher in women at 11.4% compared to 6.4%. 6.2 in men. Uh, a recent meta-analysis reported increased prevalence of around 11% of thyroid dysfunction in patients with type 2 diabetes. Of course, it varies from uh, different parts of the world. Uh, uh, it has been reported across all over the uh, continents. And uh, with regard to the Indian data, the clinical hypothyroidism, which is uh, or, you know, which is uh, referred as a TSH more than 10 milli international units per ml was present in uh, one third of the patients with the study. Of course, it's 9.8, though the number is so small, but uh, the incidence seems to be a little higher. 9.83 overt hypothyroidism and 5.9 of subclinical hypothyroidism in care. And in, in ASAM, the hypothyroidism of 23% and subclinical hypothyroidism is 3%, and antibody was positive in. 31%. So all these things denotes thyroid dysfunction among diabetics, type 2. Of course, there is an increasing trend towards a nephropathy and onset of nephropathy and neuropathy. That was observed when these two, when there is a clustering. So about 10.5% of the patients were suffering from hypothyroidism and 9% were 
were suffering from subclinical hyperthyroidism. 42% were suffering from hyperthyroidism, while 36 had subclinical hyperthyroidism. That was from Orissa. So from so it tells us clearly that the message is that there is a strong association between these two. When you see a uh, connection, uh, you know, see the association between type 1 diabetes and thyroid dysfunction. The association between autoimmune thyroid disease and type 1 has been recognized, you know, as we mentioned in the previous slides, but it's a variant of autoimmune, can be a variant of autoimmune polyglandular syndrome, referred as APS3 variant. And the autoimmune causes are reported to be responsible for the genetic dysfunction in the diabetic patients suffering from thyroid-related disorders. So there is a genetic abnormality in relation to the autoimmunity has been recognized, has been you know, studied. So that supports the association between type 1 diabetes and autoimmune thyroid dysfunction. So this is uh, the polyglandular autoimmune syndrome. So the type 1 diabetes is the commonest presentation, the first presentation that may be followed by Graves or Hashimoto's additions with Lego. They, it could be any kind of combination. The reverse could also happen if you see a Wittlego first and so on. But the commonest presentation is type 1. The meaning is that there are other uh, uh, glands are also being involved, maybe in the future. So put together, the type thyroid and diabetes so stands very tall on the list. So in the bottom panel, they say, uh, you know, any kind of combination is possible, but the thyroid type 1 and type 2, so type 1 diabetes and thyroid dysfunction is quite common. And if you see at the genetic level, there is an intersection. So various genes have been studied when the patient had thyroid dysfunction as well as type 1 diabetes. So obviously thyroid, uh, type 1 diabetes, the genetic abnormality lies on the HLA chromosome 6 and cytotoxic T lymphocyte associated antigen 4 lying at chromosome 2, protein tyrosine phosphatase non-receptor type 22 chromosome 1, forehead box P3 or X chromosome interleukin 2 receptor alpha and CD25 gene region or chromosome 10 has, has got a strong correlation. When this abnormality or genetic uh, is expressed, when there is a clinical presentation of combining these two, of course the other target genes are being understood under scrutiny, this B2 erythroblastic leukemia, very long gene, COMBOC3 gene, and so on. So the, the thing is that, you know, I'm not a genetist, uh, but the, there is a genetic, when you study that at the genetic level, probably you could have some more information. And how best this thyroid dysfunction and type 2 diabetes are associated? Because the bottom line is the insulin resistance or insulin sensitivity variation. They further improves in parallel with the increasing thyroxine concentration across a normal range. So I'm not talking about hyperthyroid patients, even with the normal population, when the TSH is varying, the insulin sensitivity varies. When the TSH is high, the insulin resistance is high. Hyperthyroidism is also associated with reduced renal clearance of insulin leading to reduced requirements for further insulin secretion, uh, especially when you can find in the management of uh, diabetes when somebody is on insulin, the requirement may be low with the onset of hypothyroids. And also, uh, on the, at the onset of hyperthyroidism, the requirements may be high. Even the patient may push to the state of diabetic ketoacidosis. And again, the hyperthyroidism also causes insulin resistance, like hyperthyroidism. And another observation is that the hyperthyroidism aggravates both micro and macrovascular complications. So that, that sends a signal that we need to be very vigilant. We need to be clinically vigilant when you have a suspicion of a, a, a thyroid dysfunction in the diabetic population. So diabetes affects thyroid function by altering the thyroid stimulating hormone level and impairing the 
conversion, uh, you know, conversion of T4 to T3 in the peripheral tissues. There is a, a, an abnormality of conversion from T4 to T3 that was noticed in diabetes at the peripheral level, though the T4 secretion is quite normal from the thyroid gland. In youth thyroid diabetic patients, the nocturnal TSH peak is absent. This one clue, you know, the, the peak is absent or reduced, and the TSH response to the TRS, TRH is also abnormal, which is impact. So this will be seen. So at the genetic level, they intersect at the GLAD2 expression in hypothyroid rats, which was observed in the day. And in the liver, the GLAD2 glucose transport R2 in hypothyroid rats was observed. Among the various genes identified, GLAD4, UCP3, so all the things are abnormal. And the skeletal muscles, GLAD4, have been proven to be mediated by the influence of T3. So arrays of genes involved in the metabolism of glucose are modulated by active thyroid hormones T3 by binding to the thyroid receptor receptors to your alpha-1, beta-1, beta-2, beta-3. So they elevate, there is also elevated concentration of T3 or noted novel missense variant in the diabetics. So this phenomenon is closely related to the insulin resistance. So also, so... There is a recent finding as elucidated polymorphism de-iodinase type 2 gene and uh, thyroid 92 alpha, which suggests the homozygosity of the polymorphism, which, run, which in turn responsible for the enhanced risk of type 2 diabetes. Okay, so when we come to the clinical area, so thy thyroid dysfunction, diabetes, and pregnancy. What happens in women when, when they are pregnant? A significant higher prevalence of hypothyroxinemia is found in women with gestational diabetes. The, also, type of anti TB was higher in pregnant women with type 1 diabetes. Postpartum thyroid dysfunction occurs in about one quarter of women with type 1 diabetes. That's what we really do. We look for, uh, you know, we repeat the thyroid function once they go home after delivery. Overt hypothyroidism during pregnancy increases the risk of diabetes later in life. So women with history of GDM also have increased risk of developing postpartum therapy. Right, so finally what happens if these two come together, there is a serious implications in terms of cardiac complications. In hypothyroidism already is a cardiovascular risk which is attributed due to dyslipidemia, which is a denominator, common denominator between the, uh, you know, thyroid, uh, diabetes itself is a, uh, is a, a cardiac risk factor, uh, so also the hypothyroidism, and uh, the, it can be attributed to the dyslipidemia, predominantly increased LDL, diastolic dysfunction, increased arterial stiffness, altered coagulability, and raised high sensitivity CRP, which also occurs in diabetes. So that are the common pathophysiological uh, findings. They share this to all these things. So subclinical hypothyroidism has been widely studied known to be associated with hypertension, gain a cardiac risk, and the hypertension is a comorbid condition to diabetes, resulting in coronary artery disease. So, the insulin resistance is the key factor, which is caused by hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, and diabetes, due to add you know, fuel to the fire of cardiac risk in, in, the, in the patients with diabetes and thyroid dysfunction. And one more important, uh, uh, you know, finding was uh, published is that the metform metformin in uh, hypothalamus is quite interesting. It has got an opposite effect in hypothalamic AMPK, inhibiting the activity of the enzyme. It affects the hypothalamic AMPK. So, so finally, what it does is that it reduces the TSH secretion at the pituitary level. Metformin inhibits through AMPK and reduces the pituitary TSH and reduces the T4 secretion. So in another study, one year metformin administration, TSH decrease was observed in diabetic patients with hypothyroidism who are treated. So what do, we, what do we do with that? So having gathered so much of information, so what do we do with the diabetic patients and thyroid dysfunction patients to look for one for the other? The guidelines, a 2017 guidelines of American Thyroid Association and uh, 
say that uh, they say the screening is recommended for in high risk women which means even a high risk women that are uh, diabetic individual that are mother is also a high risk women where the tsh has to be tested at the baseline and also anti tp antibodies the tsh is 2.5 to 10 and 2012 american association of clinical endocrinologists and american thyroid association together they say thyroid palpation clinically you should put your hand on the neck and palpate for thyroid gland and measure the tear serum tsh at baseline at regular intervals in type 1 diabetes and especially goiter autoimmune thyroid disease is present but no mention about t2 type 2 diabetes in the uk guidelines for the use of thyroid function by the british thyroid association uh, and the association of clinical biochemistry the guidelines say that tft at baseline and annually for t type 1 diabetes in type 1 diabetes tsh 3t4 and anti tpu has to be measured pre-conception at booking and at three months postpartum after delivery uh, and tft at baseline for type 2 dm that's all. There's no annual test recommended for type 2 diabetes. The NICE did not mention anything about it. And the American Diabetic Association, they say the thyroid palpation again, clinically, once you have a suspicion, you should do, but more or definitely with the type 1 diabetes, uh, with the thyroid function test and it see people. But the monitoring, they, the, the, regular, uh, the regularity of the monitoring was not ever mentioned. So to conclude, the prevalence of thyroid dysfunction in both type, type 1 diabetes and type 2 are significantly high. So you should look for thyroid dysfunction in diabetic population. In the thyroid dysfunction patient, you should look for diabetes when you have a clinical vigilance. So the genetic and metabolic intersection support the association between these two. Probably we need to study further. And the cardiovascular complications are compounding if type 2 diabetes and TM coexist. And especially when we have a large chunk of patients in the whole world, and, uh, where the trend is towards a young, uh, um, uh, you know, cardiac patients, and also more load of diabetes, and we should not want uh, other diseases to, you know, mess up with that. So it's prudent to screen diabetes in thyroid dysfunction and thyroid dysfunction in diabetes to reduce the morbidity sense to be to be helping our patients. So with that, I remind and I'll be happy to take some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arul Prakash. It was very nice you dealt a range of issues in this topic uh, about uh, associations of type 1 and type 2, their genetic associations, as well as uh, the insulin, changing insulin requirements in uh, type 1 and in uh, the different types of uh, hyper and hypothyroidism. As well as interestingly uh, about the gut hormones role uh, in uh, the manifestations of uh, thyroid and diabetes um, as well uh, so thank you very much for the talk uh, i'll be happy to thank you. forward any questions um, i couldn't find any questions in the chat box though is anybody i, I don't know whether i'm looking at the right couldn't see any anything in the chat box uh, I mean, uh, I know you would have researched uh, about this uh, gut hormones, the role of uh, adiponectin, uh, leptin. As yes. Well as, uh, yes. Uh, is there any role for um, treatment uh, with with these gut hormones? Because the uh, thyroid diseases alter the fat mass, thereby changing the levels of these uh, fat secreted hormones. And uh, uh, would there be any uh, use in uh, um, treating where they are, the levels are reduced? Uh, will that change the metabolism and improve the diabetes? Any any clue about it in your research? Uh, yes, there are uh, studies which are going on with uh, uh, in relating to the gut hormones, um, and because you know everything uh, is revolving around the AMPK, which I put it in the first as few the first few slides, uh, where the energy metabolism revolves around the AMPK, and uh, of course GH relin the uh, stimulates AMPK, whereas leptin, uh, you know, suppresses AMPK. So the gut hormones definitely works at the hypothalamus level uh, with the satiety center, appetite center, and all that. So that's uh, indirectly it works through that loop. 
And uh, some of the observation which has been made that also river, uh, uh, it might be helpful uh, to target all the three diseases, uh, obesity, thyroid, as well as thyroid dysfunction. So the thyroid analogs, some of the uh, newer analogs uh, have been tried to, to manipulate these two. So that's where they converse. The uh, I mean, uh, you know, if I'm not very uh, clear, I may not be, but I'm just trying to put it in that way. You know, the energy metabolism, everything that touch on that, and uh, that's where probably that might be helpful. But a lot of research has to be done. Yes. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I do thank agree you. that a lot of work is still going on in these areas, which yes. may promising future is there. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pakir. If there are no questions, then we can finish and uh, hand over to the organization. Thank you. Thank you.